So, uh, of course, in 2007, uh, the uh, current uh, uh, discomfort broke out with um, uh, a financial crisis, which seemed to originate in U.S. markets. And uh, it's really been the worst experience since the 1930s. Uh, it was followed very quickly by the Eurozone crisis, which we can view as a continuation of, uh, of uh, the 2007-09 crisis. And uh, just to give you a sense of um, where we uh, have been and where we are now, um, here are some IMF numbers from the fall of 2011. They're a little bit out of date. Uh, on um, real GDP levels relative to 2006. And as you can see, the industrial countries, which are uh, you know, pretty much down here, are uh, really barely uh, back to you know, where they were in uh, 2006, uh, you know, let alone um, 2007. Whereas uh, other areas, um, uh, emerging markets, have actually done significantly better. And within those emerging markets, there are also wide disparities of performance. You know, developing Asia has continued to do well. Um, Central and Eastern Europe, which was hit uh, very, very badly in the 07-09 crisis, has certainly been doing better than the industrial world, but, uh, but uh, relatively poorly compared to other emerging uh, regions. Okay. Uh, I want to ask four questions today about the um, uh, experience since 2007. Uh, number one is, is, is this really been novel? Is this really unusual in the, in the broad sweep of uh, history or even in the, the sweep of history since 1970 or so, uh, which was the onset of the modern flexible exchange rate era? Um, are financial crises predictable at all? Or do they just come out of the blue? If they are predictable, you know, how can we, how can we predict them, think about them, and maybe take um, preemptive action to prevent them? In this context, is the Euro crisis a very special type of crisis? Or does it bear you know, hallmarks that are familiar from other crises? And finally, uh, you know, if we think we have some answers to these questions, uh, what should we do about it? To, uh, to do better in the future than we've done in the last few years. So looking in historical perspective, um, you know, crises are nothing new. Uh, a recent book by Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff called This Time is Different has uh, gotten a lot of press, and maybe many of you have seen it. And it chronicles uh, the sort of empirical regularities around many, many different types of crises over many, many years. Um, Going way back, uh, Edward III's invasion of France in the Hundred Years' War was financed by uh, Italian bankers. When he ran into trouble, um, he defaulted. And this set off a financial crisis in the whole Mediterranean where those bankers were active. And uh, you know, this, was, this was a true, uh, truly sovereign, sovereign default. But uh, no doubt, going, going back even further, we can find um, um, financial crises of various sorts. Um, more recently, uh, we've had many other crises, not, not so much in Europe since uh, uh, the ERM crisis of 1992. And many of these were, were actually more severe than one might thought uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from the outcome, because they were near misses. So in uh, the early 1980s, the developing country debt crisis um, could, in principle, have taken down many of the major money center banks in the US and in Europe. But through adept management, um, this was avoided, uh, though the consequences for the, uh, the indebted countries, particularly in Latin America, were very severe. They suffered a decade of lost growth. The long-term capital market crisis in 1998 was another near miss where um, only by skillful management was a potential you know, meltdown uh, avoided in, um, in um, markets. And um, you know, the, there, there, this chart tries to give a, a sense of you know, some numbers. Um, Pierre-Olivier Gourinchon and I, um, uh, in some recent work, have tried to count up crises. And we, we divide them into instances of currency crisis, banking crisis, 
and default crisis, either external sovereign default or internal debt default by governments. These types of events overlap very often, but um, you know the numbers are, are here. So from 73 to 06, which is before the current crisis, you can see a lot of different types of crisis um, you know, as we define them. And uh, if we go past uh, 06 to the recent crisis, uh, according to our count, we have a further six external default episodes. And this is through 2010, so I'm not including Greece in this, but there are you know, countries like Ivory Coast and, and Jamaica. Um, six more external default episodes, nine currency crises, you know, 21 banking crises, mostly in the advanced economies. You know, up here, up until 06, we have zero defaults for um, industrial countries, but now we, we have uh, one, which is Greece, and maybe more on the way. So, uh, you know, there are lots of crises, and there's lots of data for economists to work with. And um, many, many economists, including, you know, myself and Pierre-Olivier Gurnshaw, uh, have worked on um, how, to, how to predict crises. Uh, as in the board game Clue, there are lots of suspects generally, and one of the big suspects from recent experience is what are called uh, global current account imbalances, a lot of discussion of these. And indeed, the period um, before the uh, uh, recent onset of crises uh, was one with historically large imbalances in uh, current accounts. Uh, you know, defined as discrepancies between national saving and national investment. If you're saving more than you're investing, then you're um, buying foreign assets. And conversely, you're borrowing abroad if your investment exceeds your, your saving. Um, interestingly, this global configuration uh, was mirrored within Europe, as uh, all of you know, uh, with the important difference that whereas in the, on, the, on the global scene, rich countries were running big def deficits within Europe, it was uh, the relatively poorer countries, and also Ireland, which uh, had been relatively poorer but had caught up to a significant degree that were running the, uh, the deficits. Um, globally, here's what the picture looks like, and you can see um, starting in the early 2000s, these um, deficits spread out. The yellow bar is the, uh, you know, I sort of add together the U.S. and the U.K., the sort of Anglo-Saxon, uh, you know, behemoth. Uh, very big deficits mirrored by, uh, of course, uh, surpluses in uh, Asia, in um, uh, oil-producing countries. Even commodity exporters uh, uh, in Africa and Latin America began running surpluses in that period. So very unusual. And these, of course, sharply contract once the, once the crisis starts reaching a low point in uh, 2009 after the Lehman um, event. Picture in the Eurozone is uh, probably familiar, but uh, just as a reminder, um, you, know, you have Greece in red uh, reaching about 15% of GDP uh, deficit on current account, but also uh, Portugal is not far behind, um, either is Spain. Ireland uh, reached a substantial deficit in, um, in 08. And on the other side is Germany running you know, historically large um, uh, surpluses. So in the Eurozone, too, there are big imbalances. And so one might say, you know, okay, we had these big imbalances, then we had crises. <coughs> crises are caused by imbalances. Um, my view is that that's a very superficial reading of the data. And uh, in fact, uh, that's kind of shooting, shooting the messenger. Um, uh, uh, as I said, the, the, the current account is the, is the net flow of international lending. And importantly, it's, it's um, not something that sort of is inflicted on a country like, like today's weather. It's the outcome of many, many, many saving and investment decisions by households, by firms, and also by government. And I think it's more productive to view these current account imbalances as symptoms of deeper underlying problems. They're not directly causal, but when you see them, you should, you should actually be, be concerned. So in the case of the Eurozone, um, uh, you know, I, think, I think 
policymakers should have looked at these with much more alarm than they did at the time. But the uh, sort of mantra and the ideology of the euro said, well, within a currency union, the current account can't possibly matter. Uh, look at the United States. You know, what is the current account surplus or deficit of the state of California? You know, we have no idea. There's no way to figure it out. The data aren't there. No one cares about it. Why then in the Eurozone should anyone care about it? Well, the answer is, is related to, you know, issues that, you know, I'll bring up later. I'm sure we'll discuss after the talk. The structural features of the Eurozone are very different from those of the U.S. currency union. Um, these imbalances, however, the fact that they could get so very, very big did reflect financial globalization, which has proceeded uh, at a very rapid pace, especially since the early 1990s. Um, within the Eurozone, a big factor was the, uh, the single currency, which removed exchange rate risk from the picture. Uh, uh, the increasing though still incomplete integration of uh, uh, financial markets um, and banking sectors. Um, and in the world at large, uh, much more um, financial intermediation and two-way flows than you know, we had seen previously. Um, uh, one measure of this increasing financial globalization, or you know, FG, is just the, the scale of gross assets and liabilities uh, in world markets. And uh, you know, much, of, much of what we uh, know here has been highlighted by work by Phil Lane and uh, um, uh, uh, his co-author at the IMF, John Maria Malesi Ferretti, um, who have sort of systematically constructed, based on a unified methodology, the, uh, the gross assets and liabilities of, uh, of uh, um, uh, basically all the, all the countries in the world. And uh, if you look at these um, uh, by income group, here's the sort of picture you get. So these numbers, uh, you know, in red is for high income countries, the um, average of gross foreign assets and liabilities relative to gross domestic product. And when I say average, I mean the GDP weighted average. And this number just uh, starting in the early 90s, starts taking off exponentially. Uh, there's a collapse to some degree in the, uh, you know, after the Lehman crisis, but it's bouncing back. And the numbers are huge. You know, on average, uh, they're over twice GDP now. Uh, for emerging markets, there has also been a process of increasing financial globalization, but um, it's nowhere near as extreme as in the case of the advanced economies, the, a the AEs. Um, these averages conceal um, sharp differences among individual countries. So, uh, you know, the U.S. is a sort of large, relatively closed in, in some senses, uh, and those numbers would be lower for the U.S., but for small economies, especially those that are hosts of significant foreign financial activity, the numbers are really uh, huge. So um, here's the example of Ireland. Uh, uh, assets uh, uh, held abroad and uh, external liabilities compared to GDP are, um, you know, above 15 uh, uh, times higher. Now, many, much of this represents financial institutions that have a physical presence here but really have little to do directly with the Irish economy, but still, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot there. And, um, you know, the net numbers are nowhere near as large. Um, they, uh, they uh, uh, you know, actually are not, not that bad until the recent, um, uh, recent last couple of years where they've plummeted to, you know, basically the net foreign asset position is about equal to minus GDP now. And um, Phil Lane has discussed some of this in a recent paper. Um, you know, I don't think it's completely well understood why, why this has happened. Uh, okay, so um, we've had a lot of financial globalization, big current account imbalances, and big crises. What do the statistics tell us? Well, if you look at a very large body of work uh, uh, by economists using econometric methods, it turns out that it's, it's not really a robust fact that if you have a bigger current account deficit, the probability of a crisis goes up. Uh, that's actually not something you can uh, definitively 
establish. Uh, different studies have different findings, but it seems that in, in and of itself a big current account deficit is not going to tell you um, uh, definitively that crisis probability is higher, though I still believe that it's something that one should be concerned about. It should cause one to ask, why is the current account deficit so big and is this actually sustainable? But there are two factors, uh, three factors actually, that do seem to be very robustly important. Uh, a real appreciation of the currency. So basically when your price level rises more quickly than the price levels of other countries measured in the same currency so that you lose competitiveness, so that your cost of living rises relative to the rest of the world, that seems to be a significant risk factor. And the other significant risk factor is the growth of domestic credit. You have a big lending boom. That seems to be a, uh, a, a problem uh, more often than not. And um, you know, domestic credit growth is related to um, current account deficits. So the US, a huge domestic credit growth before the crisis, also a big deficit. So if you see a current account deficit and domestic credit growth, then you know, be, be afraid. Uh, for emerging markets, international reserve levels tend to be important predictors of crises, though, again, this is, a, this is one of these facts that's a little hard to interpret because typically before crises, countries lose reserves. So the international reserve level may be predicting crises not because it's telling you about government policy but because it's a, a, a very direct reflection of what the market expects. But for everyone, you know, real appreciation, domestic credit growth, uh, seem to be robust. So, uh, you know, one might take those findings and say, okay, let's look at the euro crisis. How different was the euro crisis, and does it, does it fit this mold? And the answer is that it really works damn well if you look at the eurozone countries that are having problems now. Now, um, you know, Tolstoy famously wrote that every happy family is the same. Fa happy families are all alike. Unhappy families are all unhappy in their own ways. And so, you know, crisis countries all have specific features uh, that make things, you know, better or worse and uh, that may make them miserable in very special ways. Uh, the Eurozone certainly has these features, and, you know, we can talk about some of those. But uh, just looking at these sort of canonical indicators, um, real exchange rates and domestic credit growth, you know, the, the evidence is, is clearly there. So here are um, uh, measures of real exchange rates for uh, Germany, where you see, uh, so basically if you, you know, move up, your currency appreciates in real terms. Uh, you know, we know what's happened in Ireland, both before the crisis and then in the very harsh correction, a lot of deflation, so a lot of real depreciation in, in recent years. But we see for the other crisis countries, Spain, um, uh, uh, Portugal, Greece, uh, you know, significant real appreciation since uh, joining the euro. Italy shows some too, though I don't have them on this graph. Uh, they're not as, not as extreme. Uh, real appreciation um, feeds through to the economy in various ways. It makes you less competitive, but also the anticipation of higher inflation uh, leads to lower real rates of interest, uh, given that if you're in a single currency, you basically have the same nominal rates apart from the expectations of default risk, which were absent in the Eurozone until, until recently. And this lowering of real interest rates um, can uh, uh, lead to very perverse dynamics, and I think it did in the case of the Eurozone. Um, uh, so, um, you know, this is, this is something that was actually predicted by Sir Alan Walters years ago when he was advising Margaret Thatcher about the um, uh, 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 advisability of Britain's entry into the, into the Eurozone. But, um, uh, you know, you have this convergence in nominal interest rates when you have a currency union, uh, countries that are growing quickly and that have higher inflation rates Countries like Ireland, for example, will have lower real interest rates. These will um, increase expenditure. They'll lead to a bigger current account deficit. They will um, cause even more inflation because of the expenditure increases. And so there's a kind of unstable dynamic there, which I think 
well describes what happened in the um, early years of the of the um, of the uh, eurozone. And just to give you a uh, sort of picture uh, uh, of real interest rates, here's what happened. So these are the real interest rates relative to Germany of uh, of uh, the countries that are now finding themselves in the most difficulty with regard to sovereign debt. And you can see that these all drop below zero. And they actually drop starting in the late 90s because the, even the anticipation that the Maastricht Treaty would, would um, come into effect led to convergence in yields in the Eurozone. And it's only um, uh, more recently that rates have come up to zero, with the most, the most above zero, with the most, you know, uh, sort of shocking case being that of Ireland. You know, these are ex post real interest rates, which means I subtracted actual inflation. But for Ireland, the, the extreme deflation has led to very, very high um, real interest rates indeed. Um, uh, domestic credit, I mentioned, is another indicator of uh, future crises. And again, you can see for the uh, you know, sort of crisis countries, uh, where I include Spain as a crisis country, um, uh, uh, a lot of domestic credit growth you know, starting, uh, you know, really to, to accelerate in the early, in the early 2000s, uh, uh, at least for Spain and Ireland, where there were building booms, um, not so extreme at that point for Portugal, but still significant. And then Greece has the same, although, although Greece has, you know, just generally a lower level of financial development measured by ratio of domestic credit to GDP than, than these other countries. But still there, too, you can see this. Okay, so... Uh, the European story is, is uh, very familiar, and uh, there's, a, there's a whole list of special features about the Eurozone that we can, we can talk about later if we wish. Uh, of course, you can't devalue your currency unless you leave the Euro, which uh, one does not want to do lightly. Uh, but there's no fiscal union backing up this rigidity of the currency. Uh, credit has been extended within the Eurozone, inter-European official credits, to crisis countries, but they've come with a degree of conditionality on fiscal policy, which to my mind has been rather excessive and perhaps counterproductive. Um, the Maastricht Treaty restricts the ECB in terms of what it can uh, comfortably do. Uh, uh, it restricts bailouts of various kinds. And the, the structure of uh, European financial markets leads to banks having an excessive exposure to local sovereign debt. Uh, you know, one of the issues here is the absence of a European bond that can be used in monetary policy operations. Um, so, you know, what, what do we do? What do we conclude from these empirical data, from these regularities, if we want to uh, avoid future crises? Um, you know, we don't have time to go into these now, but. It's good fodder for discussion later. Uh, in the eurozone, um, a common bond is a uh, is a uh, is a uh, actually a major issue, I think, in in stability going forward and in the conduct of monetary policy. Um, a group of uh, European economists, which includes Philip Lane, uh, have uh, recommended a way in which such a common bond can be constructed without actually any, any need for a change in the, uh, in the treaty or any violation of the treaty, just through financial engineering. And um, you know, there, there are things one could do along these lines that would be very helpful, but they're not, not getting uh, you know, talked about enough. Uh, the regulatory framework that has been in effect until the crisis, basically leaving things at the national level, is um, something that hasn't worked and that can't possibly work. And so some sort of shared regulatory framework uh, beyond what has been done, beyond the European Banking Authority, needs to be constructed. Bigger firewalls uh, and going with those, an enhanced fiscal union. Um, the resolution framework is very important, by which I mean, you know, what do you do when banks, especially cross-border banks, fail? How do you wind them down? Uh, how do you wind down sovereigns, such as Greece, in an orderly manner? Uh, you know, the Greek deal was done by the seat of the pants and uh, caused massive disruption uh, in financial markets and in sovereign debt markets. And uh, structural growth promoting reforms, about which there's been a lot of talk, but 
um, much less action, are uh, certainly, certainly needed. And maybe the crisis will help bring some of those about. And if so, that would be a good outcome. Solving the Eurozone problem, of course, uh, still leaves the world economy, which itself had a major crisis from which uh, we may not be fully um, saved. And, uh, you know, if I, if, I, if I look at what's needed in the world economy, I come out with a list that actually looks just like the list I, I gave you. Um, you know, think about a common global bond. That might not be such a bad thing as a reserve, as a reserve vehicle. Um, or if not that, uh, some sort of credit lines in multiple currencies. Um, uh, 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 because what, it, what we learned in the crisis is that um, the traditional lender of last resort model, where, say, you know, the Fed lends to U.S. banks, the ECB lends to European banks, is, is, is not adequate anymore in a world of financial globalization. Financial regulatory framework, you can't do it on a nation-by-nation -nation basis when all the... Um, Financial markets are so closely interconnected. More firewalls, you know, more resources for the IMF. And that goes with, implicitly at least, enhanced fiscal union because those resources come from taxpayers in the various countries. Uh, the international resolution framework is in as sorry a state as the European one. And you know, the one mitigating factor on the global scene is that um, countries can devalue. Uh, and that can be helpful, but um, structural reforms, uh, you know, in many countries outside the Eurozone uh, would certainly help in the current uh, situation. Um, so, uh, you know, to, to conclude, you know, we can ask why these lists are actually so similar. You know, why, why are the challenges so similar inside and outside the Eurozone? And, um, you know, it's simply because many of the problems are due to financial globalization, which extends way beyond the Eurozone, and um, uh, 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 cause the same sorts of issues to arise uh, globally. Uh, you know, one can imagine a, uh, a uh, sharp worsening of the Euro crisis uh, having big impacts on financial markets outside the Eurozone, and it's simply because of all of the interconnections between the financial uh, players. Uh, solution to all of these problems uh, is going to be hard to achieve. And if it's so hard to achieve in the Eurozone, you know, imagine how hard it is to achieve more, more globally. But nonetheless, um, you know, I think that's the challenge we, we, we face. Uh, we have constructed over the past couple of decades a world that is more globalized than ever before than in any other epoch in history uh, in terms of trade and especially financial markets. And uh, the question I want to leave you with is whether um, you know, the perimeters of globalization can safely exceed those of governance. Uh, there's a debate in any currency union, you know, in the Eurozone, in the United States, about you know, what gets left to the local level, uh, what doesn't. Uh, you know, the US Constitution uh, uh, recognizes that anything involving interstate commerce, you know, whatever that is, uh, is, is the, can be legitimately the domain of, uh, of, the, uh, of the federal government. And in the U.S., there's a big debate over whether health care reform is interstate commerce or not. So, you know, obviously in the U.S., this is a big issue. In the Eurozone, you know, subsidiarity, what gets left at the national level is a big issue. Um, in a world of globalization, when you link markets, um, much more needs to be solved at the global level whether it be the Eurozone or the world economy as a whole. And how you do that is a, obviously a major political challenge. Stop there.